morning, with, uh, with this being the Sunday before we celebrate Thanksgiving, I thought it was definitely appropriate that we uh, turn our hearts and our focus towards God and all the numerous things I think we all have to be thankful for. Um, as Lisa shared, I thought about it. I was, I was so thankful that Maggie and Lisa decided to do that simultaneously. It saved me a trip. So I could just like, I was just thankful, just selfishly thankful. No, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was, it was, it was crazy how hospital visit turned into like a time of fellowship and, and like almost worship. It was wild. But um, I'm thankful for opportunities to, to be encouraged as ladies of faith sit in hospital beds and stretch your own faith, which is pretty amazing. Um, I thought this morning before, I don't know about you guys, but Thanksgiving, when you think about Thanksgiving, I think a lot of times we think about food. And family, friends, and football. That's kind of where we go. And, and those aren't bad things, but I thought before we, we get too caught up in that kind of thinking, and, and instead of compiling our regular list of things, um, which often includes food, family, friends, and football, um, instead of inclu- you know, kind of compiling that list of promotions and, and you know, all these possessions and things that we have, I thought we'd, we'd turn our hearts and our minds towards something else that maybe we could or, or maybe we should be thankful for. So this morning, we're just going to dive right in. There's not going to be a lot of intro to this. We're just going to dive right in. In the New Testament book of Colossians, if you have a Bible, Colossians is where we'll be pretty much all morning. So Colossians chapter 3 is where we'll be. But in the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul begins to wind down this letter. It's a pretty short letter. It's only four chapters. So if you're looking for something to read some evening and you don't want to read a lot, you can read Colossians. You'll be done in you know, like 30 minutes at the most. But he begins to wind down this moving and powerful letter to the church at Colossae. And he begins, he shares these words in chapter 3. So we're going to look at a few of these verses. And you're probably wondering, like, what does this have to do with Thanksgiving? And I hope you'll, I hope you'll see the tie in just a moment. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says he's kind of continuing a thought, which, which is kind of interesting. If you ever read the New Testament, and especially if you read the letters of Paul, remember that they are a letter. And unfortunately, sometimes, and I'm guilty of it, like pastors and teachers, we do a really good job of grabbing like an excerpt from a letter, like 1 Corinthians 13, everybody knows that's like the love chapter, so we'll do a whole sermon, a lesson on the love chapter. That actually happens to be part of an entire letter, and so sometimes we, we miss the full meaning if we just grab bits and pieces. We're kind of coming in at the tail end of this letter, and Paul starts out with the word sense, and so he said some things before this that leads him to this conclusion, but he said, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, and if you backed up into, into chapter 2, you'd realize at the end of chapter 2, he tells, he tells these people that he's writing to, hey, you're not subject to rules and regulations anymore, and instead, you're, you're subject to Christ ruling in your heart and in your life. It's, it's a different context. It's a different perspective. You're, you're operating from a different platform. It's no longer about keeping rules and regulations and all this kinds of stuff. And matter of fact, he finished with this idea that, hey, you're trying to kick some habits and you're doing it because people give you some rules. And he says the reality is Christ is living in you. That's where you need to focus. And, and I thought it's pretty powerful. So this word sense kind of turns the page and turns the corner for us to let us know, hey, here's the things that we have, and here's some of the things we can be thankful for and, and begin thinking about. Here goes verse 2 of chapter 3. He says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. That's a really powerful image if you think about it. Um, the idea that when you come to accept Christ, that you are, you are hidden well within his protective hands. And, and everything that touches your life is, is there for a reason, whether, whether you kind of realize it, believe it or not. He says, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ to God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So then he goes on and says, here's some things we should do. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality or impurity or lust and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater. It means they want more things than God. They want something other than God. They worship, worshiping the things of this world. Verse 6, he says, because of these sins, the wrath of God is coming on the disobedient. There's a, we, we preach and we teach and we love God's love, but a part of God's love is also his, his sovereignty and his holiness and, and the sense that because God loves Evil has to be dealt with. And, and he says that these sins, these things that end up in our lives, if we continue in that path and we don't accept Christ and we follow that road, there's going to be a point where God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. And then Paul says to them, he says to us, really all of us, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. 
And I love this. But now is the time. Now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. And don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And he says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I love this verse. In Christ, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us that believe. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul's kind of writing to this church. He's writing to these people. He's telling them, hey, here's some things you need to put away. Here's some things you need to put on. And in verse 13, he says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And, and, and not because he's going to guilt you, but he reminds us. He says, remember, the Lord forgave you. That usually is the biggest problem we have with forgiveness is we forget what we've been forgiven of and for. That's usually our biggest block is we forget what we've been forgiven of and for. If we would remember that, it makes forgiveness on our part a whole lot easier. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. Verse 14, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. and Be thankful. And I love that. What a, what a difference your life is, and what a difference your life makes, and what a difference the church environment becomes when there are thankful people rather than complaining people, Right? What a difference we have in the lives of others if we, if we have all the reason in the world to be thankful and we express that by the way we live. We all have, all, if you're here this morning and you're a believer, you have every reason in the world to be thankful. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you have every reason in the world to be thankful because you have an opportunity this morning to become a believer, to, to accept Christ and, and start that new journey. And he says you should be thankful, live thankfully. That makes a huge difference in our lives and in the lives of others. And he goes on, he kind of, kind of piggybacks on this idea with this. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. How good does that message come across if we are complaining, grumbling, always negative people? How well does that message get introduced and infused in the lives of others that are kind of on the fence? Maybe they've heard about Jesus. They're not into the religion thing. They've, you know, the whole God thing is kind of a weird thing. And we're going to tell them all about God's love and grace, but we are complaining, grumbling, miserable, whiny people doesn't work. He says, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your life first. And when it does, it'll flow into the lives of others. It says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. It says, sing psalms. We do that here from time to time. Actually, if you think about it, some of the verses that go up on our, in our mornings and some of the songs we sing out of the books are actually psalms that David and others wrote. That They're, they're set to music, probably more modern music than what they did back then, but Nonetheless, the words are the same. And hymns. Somebody help me out. What's a hymn? Anybody know? If it's in a book, it's a hymn, right? Not necessarily. Hymns are just songs that are directed toward God. A good way to remember that is hymns. Hymn. So a song like How Great Thou Art, that would be a hymn. It's a song directed towards God. It says that the richness of Christ's message in its fullness, living our lives, and we teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives, not our own worldly wisdom or what we think you should do and how good we are and how you're so messed up and here's what you should do to fix you. Um, but he says, give wisdom that he gives and then sing. Sing psalms and sing hymns, songs that are about God and spiritual songs. Those are songs about Christian experience. Amazing Grace would fall into the category of a spiritual song, which is pretty interesting because whenever we have these conversations about that modern music and these old songs, it always comes back to, we should sing good old hymns like Amazing Grace. Well, first of all, Amazing Grace isn't a hymn, technically. Um, it's a spiritual song. And Jesus never sang it. And the word, the name God never shows up in the whole song. And all you are freaked out, you're going to look at your book. It actually doesn't. It's never mentioned. It's, it's a song about the Christian experience, about God's amazing grace in our lives and what it's doing. And so he says, hey, this is what a, a church life should be like, that they're singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we sing these to God with thankful hearts. And then it seems like that would be a great place to end, but that's not where Paul ends. He, fin he finishes this little section with this thought, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. 
I, thought, I was reading through these verses this past week, and, and these verses do such a great job of describing a life changed by God's grace and a life that's full of gratitude towards God, with just kind of overflowing with genuine gratitude. Paul says, hey, this is what a life of gratitude looks like. It's a life that, that puts away the negative stuff, and it, it strips away those destructive actions and debilitating attitudes. That's what a generous, gra- gracious Life full of gratitude looks like, that it's, it's just hearts that are focused on eternal things and we don't get so caught up in earthly things and it's hard for us because we live here. But he says, you live here, but your mind and your heart should be there, which is tough. I know it's hard for all of us. We, you hit stuff and I, I, we were, I was joking about it the other day. Clark came over last night. We were sitting around. He's like, did you get, your, get the battery? We had a battery issue going on with the, the Durango, you know, and it was like, ah, you know, $200 later, the thing finally starts, and I'd rather just, like, club it to death, you know, with, with, a, with a $2 bat. It would just, like, save a whole lot of money. But it's like, we get so caught up in those kinds of things that happen, you know, it doesn't happen the way we thought it would or should and, and all this kind of stuff. And Paul says, hey, don't get caught up there. Don't get stuck there. He talks about hearts that reflect genuine gratitude to God, and he says they reflect it through acceptance and compassion through kindness and humility, through gentleness and patience, through forgiveness and love and unity. He says we, we should be people who have encouragement flowing from our lives and praise flowing from our lips. He says that's what a life of gratitude looks like. And unfortunately, you guys, sometimes Christians are the world's worst complainers. If you don't think so, go to Facebook in about five minutes. I, I found myself even guilty of it. You know, I was doing like the 20, 30 days of thankfulness or whatever. And it's so funny. Somebody put something out there and said, hey, you know, the 30 days of thankfulness, that's when people actually quit complaining for about 30 days. And then they go back to it. It's kind of true. Kind of true. Yeah, we, Paul says a thankful life, a, a life full of gratitude is marked by people who have encouragement that flows from their life and praise that flows from their lips. And what's amazing when you think about this These words about thankful lives and thankful living have challenged and blessed people and blessed churches for over nearly 2,000 years. But what's amazing is to think that these words, these powerfully encouraging words, were penned by a man who sat falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, and bound by chains. He wrote these words about thankful living and a thankful life, falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, and bound by chains. God would inspire Paul to write about love and forgiveness. He would inspire him to write about compassion and kindness. He would inspire him to write about gratitude and grace, not as he sat in luxurious surroundings, but as he sat chained. He would inspire him to write these words. And and instead of focusing on his change, on on the chains that, that Paul is bound by, he turns his focus and he helps turn our focus on who Christ is and what he has done. And what he is doing in our lives and around us and through us. And the thought is, is Christ does these things even in and often through your most difficult trial. Sometimes you forget about that. That sometimes the biggest impact God can make in your life is through the trials that you're walking through. As he tries to express to people around him why you can live a life of thankfulness and gratitude even when circumstances would dictate otherwise. That's different, you guys. That's a difference that the world takes notice of because that's not normal. Normal is bad stuff happens and we get on Facebook and complain about it. Normal is maybe you don't get on Facebook, but we we whine and complain and and we bellyache and, oh, my life, and it's so horrible and so terrible. And and I'm I'm not minimizing your situation, your circumstances. What I'm trying to do is maximize the fact that if you're a believer, Christ is in you and you have victory, okay? You win, No matter what your circumstance says today, you win. And that's what Paul was trying to tell us. That even in and often through the most difficult trials, Christ is working. God is working. I I read these verses and I thought, isn't it just like God to use Paul's chains to encourage us with words of challenge? Isn't that just like God? Isn't it just like God to bring beauty from ashes or or to use, use life's battles to bring about blessings? Isn't it just like God to turn what looks like a mess into a powerful message of his love and his grace and his provision, his purpose? Isn't it just like God to use the trials of this life to stretch your own faith and encourage faith in others? 
That's just like God. I was reminded of these timeless words of Andre Crouch's song, Through It All, as I read this. Let me remind you of the third verse of that song, if you've never heard it or sang it before. Andre Crouch wrote these words. He says, I thank God for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys, and I thank him for the storms he brought me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. While we're on the topic of being thankful, guys up for a history lesson real quick? You're good with that? Last week, was it last week? You guys learned baptizo. You guys were awesome. You, you, some of you guys, some of the teens still remembered it. Last Wednesday night we were talking about it. They, they dialed in on that word. That was awesome. Uh, matter of fact, I think, where's, was it William? Was William? He, oh, uh, we, he, they, the teens were like, yeah, they remember the word baptizo. I'm like, awesome. What's the word for sprinkle? And they were like all over it. Oh, that's a good test. What's the word for sprinkle, guys? Rantizo, very nice. Poor? Oh, see? Just go back and watch it again later. Um, Exhale, exhale. Yeah, we were talking about baptism last week, but we're going to do a little history lesson real quick. We did Greek lesson last week. We'll do a little history lesson this week. Anybody remember which U.S. president issued the proclamation that set the precedent for America's National Day of Thanksgiving? Anybody remember who that was? No? Good guess, though. George Washington actually kind of threw it out there first back in 1789. He said, we should be thankful. We should have a day of thanks. The problem was is when he did that, every, like, every state and, and regions of, of, that, of the country at the time, obviously the country was a bit smaller at that time, kind of had their own day. They kind of picked their own day, and they did it at their own time. And, and it wasn't kind of like nationally set. It was, hey, here's the day. Actually, the, the first president to ever set forth a national day of Thanksgiving, a proclamation, was Abraham Lincoln. It was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise, which is kind of interesting because we always call it, well, it's Thanksgiving. Actually, technically, it's Thanksgiving and praise day, not just Thanksgiving day. He said, a nas- a day, as a day, set that last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. I wonder if a president would write such a proclamation today that we give thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. He probably wouldn't use dwelleth, but but hopefully would still say it. Anybody know what year that took place? Just kind of guessing. Oh, so close, 1863, but so close. So you you guys that are history buffs, anybody remember what was happening in our country in 1863? Middle of it. Middle of the Civil War, hard and heavy Civil War. Abraham Lincoln issued this proclamation of thanksgiving and praise on October 3rd, 1863. I want you to just listen to this. Let this sink in for a minute. A year and a half after losing his second son of four to typhoid fever, they would have four sons. Only one would live to adulthood. He would issue this proclamation of thanksgiving and praise a little over a year after the battle of Antietam which is still the bloodiest single-day battle in American history, with a combined total of 22,717 wounded, missing, or dead in one day. This proclamation of thanksgiving and praise takes place three months to the day following the Battle of Gettysburg, where the country suffered the horror of nearly 50,000 casualties in a three-day battle. Even in the midst of these tragedies and trials, President Lincoln still believed there was a reason to pause and give God thanks and praise. This past Wednesday evening in our teen discovery meeting, Greg Breckley did a tremendous job of helping us push past the easy things to be thankful for. And he challenged us and reminded us that we should be mindful of and thankful for the challenges and the struggles and the valleys that God has placed in or permitted for our lives. So with that, we're going to do something a little out of the ordinary this morning. I've asked uh, Brother Eldon and Sister Adon to share a little bit of their own story with us this morning. And as they make their way forward, I'd like for you to watch this uh, powerful video that Greg brought to us this past Wednesday as well.
my husband wanted me to talk a little bit first. We started our journey together almost 25 years ago. 45 years ago, I'm sorry. <laughs> it seems to so fast. <laughs> and um, he's going to share some things that he has gone through and that we've gone through together. And it really isn't about us, but it's about the one who loves us and who we love. <clears throat> Back a few years when the situation when I was in Vietnam, when I um, left Vietnam, I thought I closed the door. But with the circumstances that what happened to, to me back then, um, I couldn't talk about it. But with God's help with that and the medical things, which I'll explain later. But I thought I closed the door on that, but it, it, came, it, um, I, it came back with me. And through that, how God mysteriously did in my life that I hope nobody goes through. And the main thing that I remind me, I believe in prayer. I believe 100%. But what brought me through was his promises. I think I, he'll never leave you or save me, I think I wore that verse out of the problems that I faced. I believe in prayer, but with that, that helped me out. And with prayer, it kind of reminds me of this guy, this commercial with the cell phone. Can you hear me now? And, but, as you said, um, I want to go on a little further, but as many of you know, the last few years that uh, my wife and I, my wife and I, had gone through a lot of health problems, especially me. But some of them, it has been cured. Some are still going. But with that, what happened? How it started out was back a few years ago. Um, I was having some eye problems. I went to the eye doctor here. I was still working and everything. I thought everything going great, but I went to the eye doctor here in town. He saw something in my left eye that he did not know what it was, but he wanted a specialist to find out. So over in Bearwood had a specialist. And that specialist told me in my left eye, the retina has gone. What do you mean by that? Uh, I don't know what it, why it, why it's there, but to get a second opinion, I was going to the VA um, at that time. So I, to get a second opinion, um, I went to the VA and, and with a, a, a specialist, uh, and he told me the same results. But so I just left it going on on and so forth, uh, and. As time went on, um, uh, how the Lord, all the health uh, questions that uh, I went through, that uh, the next, it just, uh, um, I didn't think of my thoughts, but uh, that the next thing that happened that um, with, with my wife um, had surgery and, and, uh, with the surgery and everything that uh, uh, um, that she had, it, I'm very thankful for it. That, uh, uh, it came out that uh, um, <clears throat> that it came back negative, but she found out that she had diabetes. And people, you know, people that you know what when you have diabetes, you go through a lot of things. But uh, with that situation. Uh, I'm very thankful, but before that, um, I was having having some back problems, 
And it was, I remember going to the VA. I mean, my back problems, I was either I, I uh, stooped down, it was like someone just poked a knife in my back. And I, so I went to the VA and I, and I had a, a test and everything and the doctor came and I'll never forget it. She said, well, you're a mess. Well, I told, you know, I said, I know that I'm a mess. You don't have to tell me that. But I didn't know how, how, uh, how serious it was. The reason why I'm in this, this, this uh, role there because of what it is, uh, I got arthritis degeneration of the spine. And, and with all that, uh, she put me on a restriction. And with the restriction, uh, I had, I couldn't, I couldn't lift them up any more than uh, 25 pounds and anything. And she, so I, I was working and everything. So I went to work the next day and, and, and uh, the place where I worked at says, well, you don't, we don't need you no more. And that was very devastating. Very devastating. It's just, uh, it, you know, I, I had a wife, I had a home. Well, at that time, my mother-in-law was living with us, and you know, and but how God worked in so many ways that uh, He used not only the prayer but he used people too. You know, different things. I have said, you know, sometimes you know prayer helps, but you need people, God and skin, that have came to me, and 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 the, you know, with the, within two months, um, the situation at work, I, the only pay that we had was was um, my wife babysitting. I lost everything, and and you know when you lose everything, if you everything seems to Everything goes wrong. If it wasn't something wrong with the car, the house, but with God's mercy and God's grace, He He provided the way. And and with all that, with the situation with my bank and everything, then a few months later, uh, um, I went to the VA because of being in Vietnam. Uh, they took a biopsy, and and uh, and I and I called and and I had that turn. I waited for the result that I had cancer. And when I had cancer, it just I was very devastating. Got to the point where okay, Lord, just call the funeral home, go to the funeral home, pick up my. Pick, pick out everything that I need and, and do that, but, but my friend, which I won't go into, um, which I met back in the service, uh, he was a chaplain, and he, and he he helped me through that, and you know, it just uh, it was amazing. But all I could say right now is, is with the cancer and with my eye situation, which is a ongoing thing, I could say that I'm cancer free. And I'm very, I'm very thankful for that because this Thursday we're going to be uh, celebrating Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, when I was younger, I just Thanksgiving it was turkey and football and so forth. But Thanksgiving, to me, means more than just football and turkey. He spared my life. And I'm very thankful for that. And this journey is not really about us or about the Lord. It's about trusting and waiting on his timing. He's taught me many things about that. And as a wise man once said, that when you cannot see the hand of God, you trust the heart of God. And there's times when I didn't, I could literally feel the presence of God. 
so close it was almost like I felt I could reach out and touch him. But there were other times when I didn't sense his presence at all. And those were the hardest times. But the Lord would also use the same scripture that he used with him. I will never leave you. No, never, no, never leave you. And I'd say, Lord, I don't feel you, but I know you're there. I know you see me. I know you see what we're going through. And you haven't forgotten us, and you haven't left us. In saying that, get God's word in your heart before you go through your trials. Don't wait till you're in the trial. Fill your mind and your heart with his word ahead of time. Because when you go through these trials, those scriptures will come to you that will strengthen you and ground you and put you deep in the rock of Jesus Christ. One time, when our son was small, he was outside playing, and I was looking out at the window, out the window, watching him. And he did not know that I was watching him, but I had my eye on him. And God often is looking out of the window of heaven at you. You may not be aware that He's watching over you or paying attention to you, but he is. He has his eye on you. And no matter what, he go, what you're going through, he hasn't forgotten you, and he cares. When Eldon first lost his job and could no longer work, I sat at our kitchen table and laid the bills out in front of me. And I said, Lord, we have more bills than money. We had my hospital bill. We had our monthly payments. We were caring for my mother. And we had a house to upkeep. And I made this promise. And he was 100% behind it. Whether a dollar or a hundred dollars come in, we are going to tithe first. And then as the bills come in, either pay on them or pay them off. And God heard that prayer. And sometimes you have to step out in obedience and do what God wants you to do, whether you see any, any way to fulfill that. We had three major things that happened over and beyond those bills. We didn't have enough money to pay the bills, let alone extra things that happened, like $200 for the furnace and things like that. But God took care of our needs. I remember one one day I had a $20 bill. Didn't have the $20. Just to talk to the Lord about it, went outside of all things, went behind the other side of our mobile home. Up against the wall was a $20 bill. Not a soul in sight. I don't know where it came from, but I know where it came from. It came from the hand of God. And we paid our $20 bill. I have seen him do so many marvelous things like that. It would take a list a mile long to be able to enumerate it all. But I want you to know, you can never outgive God. And he honored that promise. And he used his children to help us. And let me say in that, when God lays someone on your heart, whether it's to pray for them, do so. I'm alive today because God laid me on somebody's heart, two people, two people's heart, and they prayed for me that day. They didn't know what they were praying for or why. Seven o'clock that evening, my mother and I were driving, and a deer hit another car that was going past, 
flew over and landed on our car on the hood and started to come through the windshield. I couldn't see, didn't know what was going on, but their prayers saved my life. And shortly after, a deputy came by, and he said to my mother, I don't know how she ever made it out of that alive. I do. God, and somebody praying. Don't ever not pray or not give or whatever, or whatever God asks you to do because there's a reason why he's laid that on your heart. And most of all, I would say that I have learned so much through all our trials and experiences, some of which I've mentioned. I am so thankful, and my heart is full of gratitude to the one who has done so much for us. And I've learned so much about his marvelous, wondrous grace in a much deeper, deeper way, and it has become so precious to me. When I think I can't stand to face anything else or the burdens and problems get too heavy, I just go to him and ask him, Lord, I need more grace. And you know what? He's never, ever said no to me, but he's always given me the grace that I needed for that trial, for that time, for whatever. I would like to read a scripture found in Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14. This is Paul's prayer to the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, and especially verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, amen, that's true, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. I can honestly say I'm thankful for the trials that we've gone through because he's taught me so much about himself and he sees the rough places in our heart that needs to be changed and he uses these trials and these things to, to smooth those places out and to make us more like the image of his son. And that's really what it's all about that we be more and more like Jesus every day. I brought this along. You see this hand? I hope you can see it. But on the other side is a small child. The Bible says that we are in the hollow of his hand. And this small child is not fighting and kicking or all those things, but he's resting. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to rest in the hollow of his hand. I would like for us to sing a couple choruses. It may be, you will know them, I'm sure, and you can sing with me. You can sit or you can stand. But I would like to sing this because I have a song in my heart because of God's graciousness, his love, and his mercy. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he was.
watches me. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. And Pastor, I want to give this to you. I appreciate uh, Brother Eldon and Sister Adon um, being willing to do this. I kind of called them up on short notice and said, um, I'm thankful for them. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes it, we don't realize it, but the stretching of others' faith oftentimes inspires and stretches our own. And I don't know if that was the only purpose. I have to believe God had a bigger purpose than my own selfish purpose of my faith being stretched, but I know that's part of what he accomplished. As I watched Brother Eldon, Radon, Sister Radon go through what they've gone through, it stretched my faith. I don't know if you guys caught that at the end of the video that it talked about over 30,000 kids per year have been ministered and helped through the Spafford Children's Center. Think about this for a second. Had they not lost their four daughters in that tragedy, hundreds of thousands of kids' lives would have not been touched nor helped. So I want you to understand, whatever it is you're going through, been through, may still yet to go through, God has a purpose. And it's a big one. And it's valuable. And because it is, you can be thankful. I'm going to ask the praise band, if they would, to come forward. We're going to close out this morning with a song familiar to us, to us all. As we finish this out, we sing this song as we get ready to close. I'll ask uh, Brother Scott at the end of the song, would you dismiss us in prayer?